Hello, and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today, I'll be talking about Season 8, Episode 7, The Checks. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, Real quick, I wanted to acknowledge that Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast, is now three years old. Last Sunday, April 20... Shit. (laughs) April 20... Shit. No, April 21st was the three-year anniversary. And I didn't mention it last week. I sort of forgot if I'm if I'm being honest. But when I was in Moab and I looked at my calendar, I have it marked on my calendar. I was like, oh, this is the three-year anniversary. And if everything goes to plan, there will not be a four-year anniversary because this thing should wrap up before next April. And my son asked me, I said that to him when we were driving. And he said, well, then what are you going to do after that? Are you going to keep doing podcasts? And I said, I don't know. So I definitely probably take a break, maybe just promote this podcast while it's uh, no longer um, (laughs) just promote it in its entirety and be like, you can listen to every single episode. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I'll do after Hot and Heavy is over. I really didn't have a plan beyond this to podcast any further. And maybe that's what it'll end up being. Um, but you never know. Maybe my dream of becoming friends with JLD will will finally come true. And she and I do a podcast together. I mean, why not? I think that would be really fun. Except it would just be me being like, Oh, my God, you're so awesome. Oh, my God, I love you. <laughs> JLD, you're so amazing. Uh, yeah, that probably wouldn't be very fun. But um So yes, three year anniversary, very proud of this podcast, very uh, thankful for all of the support. Thank you out there. Um, I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you've stayed along for the ride and um, keep keep going with me because we have another season and a half to go. Speaking of Moab, yeah, that was the trip we took last weekend. And I just, I forget, I don't forget how beautiful it is, but I'm always just stunned when I'm I'm in Moab. Like it is just the most beautiful place. I highly recommend it to anyone who is looking for a really great town to visit. There's hiking, there's mountain biking, there's rafting. We went horseback riding. There's a cute downtown. So there's shops and awesome restaurants. There's like these ATV off-roading tours you can do and the dunes. I mean, there are so many things. I know we haven't done a lot of uh, the activities in Moab. We stick to what we know. My husband mountain bikes at least two or three times while we're there. The kids and everyone, we did the horseback riding, like I said, but we also hiked up to the Delicate Arch, which is, it's an intense hike. And once you get up there, it is, um, well, it's a little scary uh, if you are afraid of heights, I will say that, but it is, you have to hike up a mile and a half to see just such an amazing sight. And it's it's worth it. it. It's totally worth it. And finally this year, we have it in past years because I was too much of a scaredy cat. And I think I sort of passed that along to my daughter. But um, this year, we did get up there and we got scared to go down to the arch. So like, you get up there, you can see the arch. And then there's this kind of ledge that you have to walk along to get like if you want to go under the arch and like get a, get a picture of it. I'll post it on the hot and heavy socials. But we got up there. I took one look at it. I had the intention to go and stand under the arch. But I got scared. And my daughter was like, yeah, I don't want to do it either. So my son and my husband went. My son's fearless. <laughs> and as I'm sitting on kind of this more secure, um, wider piece of ledge, which is not not as scary, I'm just noticing all walks of life going down that sort of narrow edge. It's not even that narrow. It's just kind of slants down and there are no guardrails, nothing. And they've done that to preserve what it is. And I, and I totally appreciate that. I wouldn't want them to put up like railings or whatever. But anyway, there's a huge just drop <laughs> basically uh, into this kind of really deep bowl, they call it. And then behind the arch, it's just a straight down drop. So you have to be careful. But as I was sitting there and my husband and my my son went, um, I was watching, like I said, just all ages, all abilities, making that walk over to the arch. And I was like, come on, you've, you've hiked all the way up here. 
So finally, I was like, I'm going to do it. And then my my daughter was like, wait, what, what? And I said, we'll do it together. We'll hold on to each other. It's going to be fine. And my son was so proud. He was like, oh, oh, it's it's not that bad, you guys. It's not that bad. And another really helpful thing is it's sandstone and it's like super grippy. So you feel very secure, even though you're walking on this slant and the slant just drops down into a very scary hole <laughs> or bowl, they call it. But yeah, we did it. And so I'll, I'll post that. Uh, the whole family got really good pictures under the arch. And so I felt very proud of myself, but even uh, more proud of my daughter who did it as well. We were scared and we were very much, we were moving at a snail's pace. But I was like, you know what? If that lady who's got two walking sticks, braces on her knees, and looks to be in her 70s can do this, I can do this. So very proud of us. One more thing I wanted to mention I, of course, have been listening to the new season of Wiser Than Me, JLD's incredible podcast. And this past week, she had Ina Garten on as a guest. Well, I guess it was two weeks ago. Um, I'm just catching up. And so they talked about food quite a bit. She's the Barefoot Contessa, for those of you who are familiar. I love her. She It was a great interview, by the way. You should listen to it. Anyway, a couple things I learned about JLD in that episode that totally are the opposite of what I feel. So I'm just like, this friendship might be a little complicated once it does actually happen, which it 100% will. JLD loves cilantro, like can't get enough of it. She puts it in everything, as she said. I have that that thing where cilantro tastes like soap to me. Like, don't get it near me. I don't want to smell it. I don't want one leaf on my food. No, can't do it. Hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. At Chipotle, my burrito bowl was ruined because I didn't realize they put cilantro in the rice, although I think now it's called cilantro lime rice. (laughs) So that's on me. Anyway, I was like, well, I'm not going to go back up and have them redo it. I just, whatever, I'll just grin and bear it. And it was, it was like eating a bowl of soap with guacamole on top. I hated it. And JLD revealed that she has a rampant sweet tooth, like loves sweets. It's very hard for her to resist sweets. And I am a savory girl. I'm all about the salty. I'm all about the sour. So I don't know, we'll work it out. I know when JLD and I become super close friends, we'll we'll work that stuff out. When we go out to eat, you know, I won't have to share her dessert. She won't have to um, worry about me grabbing her cilantro. And, And you know, it actually might work. It's a good, it'll be a good symbiotic relationship. All right, let's get into this episode. The synopsis for the checks is as follows. Jerry hurts his hand endorsing hundreds of 12 cent royalty checks received for an appearance he made on Japanese television. George is frustrated in his attempts to join a cult masquerading as an office cleaning company. Kramer's expensive new chest of drawers provides housing for three Japanese tourists. Elaine's new boyfriend is obsessed with the Eagles song Desperado. This episode was written by Steve O'Donnell, Tom Gamel, and Max Pross. All right, we start out on the street. This is our cold open. Jerry and Elaine walk out of a pharmacy, and Jerry starts talking about all the indigestion meds. Elaine says, yeah, the whole country's sick to their stomach. Jerry starts talking about how you're supposed to take these meds, and Elaine asks if this is a bit, because she's not in the mood. He's like, no, we're just talking. So he continues on about how these are medicines for the well. She's like, I know that tone. This is a bit. So she has to listen to the rest of it. She says, are you done with your little amusement? So you admit it was amusing. She's like, it was okay. Just move the medication for the well to the front and hit the word good harder. And he says, got it. Uh, My take on this scene, it's a fun scene. And this was originally supposed to air as the cold open for the fatigues. A little trivia for you. Now, as someone who is a comedic performer, now I do improv comedy and I do sketch comedy. This is really common if you're friends with stand-up comedians. It's not, I mean, I should I, sh- I shouldn't call them out, but I I am just because Jerry's a stand-up, but we're we're bitty people. We'll 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 start a bit. It's probably insufferable for most non-comedian types, but especially with stand-ups, you totally know their tone and cadence when they're doing a bit. Um I remember I was in a an improv troupe. And one of the guys in the troupe was a stand up. And that was I think that was his true dream. But he was doing this improv stuff on the side. And we went out to dinner. And I just happened to be it was like a long table, There was like probably 10 of us. And I just happened to be right across from him. 
And it was exhausting because it was just bit after bit after bit. And I try to like just start up a conversation and it was almost like he just had a one track mind. He was, I, I believe they were rehearsed. It was a little bit exhausting. Um, so I can definitely relate to this. <laughs> and I like how I didn't know him well enough to do an Elaine, which I'm like, I'm not in the mood. Can you stop? But anyway, I do love that Elaine calls Jerry out. And that blow line at the end where she tells him how to punch it up is really perfect. I just think it's a really cute scene overall. All right, next we are at a party. I think it's a party or is it a furniture store? I don't really know, but it's a bunch of people with glasses of wine. And Elaine is here with her new boyfriend. And she's asking about his work. And he says he manufactures the furniture designed by Carl Farbman. Elaine is impressed. He says, you know Farbman? Oh, I love Farbman, she says. He says, you know, most people go their whole lives never sitting in a Farbman. If you can call that living. <laughs> she laughs and laughs. And then we hear a song come on and her boyfriend, Brett, gets very distracted. Elaine tries to keep the conversation going. Wouldn't it be great if Farbman designed shoes? Brett? Wouldn't that be great? And he's just in another world. And he says, after this song, babe. And Elaine is just so touched. And of course, the song playing is Desperado. Um, my take on this scene, we learn a lot in this scene, but it's not super expositional, which I love. Brett's vibe is apparent from the get-go. He's a fancy furniture guy, and Elaine is very into him, you can tell. And we see what her story will be in the episode with that moment Desperado starts playing. And I just have to give a shout out to Brett. Um, the actor who plays him is James Patrick Stewart. He's got three first names. I remember seeing him in this episode and only knowing him from General Hospital. So I, I mean, to say I was impressed with his performance in this episode is an understatement. I mean, he's a great comedic actor and he actually goes on to do a lot more comedies after this. But um, anyone familiar with soap operas knows that that type of acting... It's just different. It's usually very over-the-top dramatic. Now, General Hospital, to be fair, was probably the best when it came to more like grounded performances. But nevertheless, I'm going to call him JPS. JPS wasn't ever able to really showcase any kind of goofy like uh, mannerisms or anything in General Hospital. But as Brett, it's just it's out there. He's such a weirdo. <laughs> And he's really funny, just a really masterful comedic performance. And I also love the chemistry between the both of them. JLD plus JPS equals OMG. I don't know. <laughs> All right, next we are on the street. Jerry is wondering when he gets to meet this jerk. He's not a jerk, Jer. He only works with Carl Farbman. Who? I don't know, some designer. She says how he's so generous and sensitive. I mean, last night he was moved just by listening to a song. Jerry asks, what song? Desperado? And you're still dating him? I'll tell you who sounds a little desperado. <laughs> it's so cheesy, but I actually like that moment. Jerry sees an umbrella vendor in the distance spinning an umbrella, and he tells Elaine that he invented that move. She points and says that that had to be invented? And he tells her that when he was starting out as a comedian, he used to sell umbrellas and that the twirl would attract customers. Well, Elaine clearly doubts him. She says, well, why don't we ask him about it? So she walks up to the guy and tells him that Jerry invented the twirl. And Jerry's like, Elaine, that's a long time ago. He doesn't need a history lesson. And the umbrella guy says that Teddy Padillac invented the twirl. And Jerry knows who that guy is. He didn't invent it. Elaine's bored by this conversation. She's like, can we go? <laughs> As they're walking away, Jerry tells him that he's twirling too fast. He'll disorient the customers. My take on this scene, Elaine will take any opportunity to cut Jerry down. And that's why we love this friendship. She wants so badly to call bullshit on his claim of inventing that twirl. And also, at the same time, acknowledges how stupid it is, which is probably why she wants to cut him down. <laughs> I love how she's like, that needed to be invented. <laughs> Uh, Jerry's also really fun here. I love how proud and cocky he is about this twirl. And also classic Elaine fashion to get so bored so easily once Jerry and the umbrella dude start to disagree. I mean, she started it, but she also wants it to end when she's done with the conversation. And Jerry's delivery of that last line, it always amuses me. I love the, he'll disorient the customers. <laughs> it's really taking this seriously. All right, next we are in Jerry's apartment. Jerry is showing George the twirl, but George, ugh, he finds it disorienting. 
He's also confused why anyone would buy an umbrella. You get them free in those cans in the coffee shops. Those belong to people, Jerry says. Kramer enters and hands Jerry a big envelope. Oh no, not more checks. George wonders what checks. He tells them they're residuals from this small appearance in a Japanese comedy show, Super Terrific Happy Hour. George sees the pile of checks and says, oh my God, you're rich. He's like, no, each one's worth about 12 cents. It's barely worth the trouble to sign them. Kramer asks Jerry if he needs any new furniture because Elaine's boyfriend is giving him this oversized chest of drawers. It's a Farbman. George can't believe it. He's giving you furniture. Who is this guy? Jerry says, who are any of her losers? George reminds him, you're on that list. (laughs) I love that moment so much (laughs) because what can Jerry say? (laughs) George has to leave to meet some carpet cleaners who are cleaning his whole place for 25 bucks. Kramer asks if it's the sunshine carpet cleaners. And George says, yeah. Oh, no. He tells George they're a crazy religious cult. Cleaning the carpet is just their way to get into your place. George could care less. He's like, yeah, for 25 bucks, I'll listen to some pointless blather. I do it. I'm not even getting the cleaning, Jerry says. All right, next, we're on the street. Jerry's complaining because his hand hurts from signing over 100 checks. Hello, $12. (laughs) Kramer's so excited. Some Japanese tourists stop Kramer to ask him to take a picture of them in front of just a totally boring generic building for whatever reason. Jerry sees an umbrella vendor down the way and he says, I'm going to go talk to him. So he goes over and he says, nice twirl. You know who invented that, don't you? We cut back to Kramer and the tourists. He asks if they're from Japan and points to Jerry if they recognize him. He's from the super terrific happy hour. And then they do recognize him. Oh, yeah. Then one of them asks, what is he doing? We see Jerry animatedly talking to the vendor. Kramer says, well, I don't know, but something super terrific, I'll bet. Oh, he's funny. Oh, yes, very funny. Kramer tells them it's it's not impolite to laugh at his antics. And they, they all start laughing at Jerry, who's twirling an umbrella and kind of sidestepping, kicking out his feet, totally looking like a weirdo. All right, next we're at George's apartment. Oh, the cleaners are all done. And the guy says, uh, there's just one more thing. And George thinks, okay, here it comes. Well, turns out the guy just needed to tell George he forgot to sign his check. So George signs it and asks if there's anything else. No, the guy says. Well, they start walking out. So so that's it? Uh, Unless you need a receipt, the guy asks. "Ah, I wish that was all I needed. George says how his life is so confusing and he's searching for answers. Ah, Good luck with that, the guy says, and they exit. Uh, Next, we're at Jerry's apartment. Elaine enters and Jerry waves at her from the table where he's signing his checks. And she's like, well, what's with the claw? He says, super terrific carpal tunnel syndrome. Brett enters and Elaine introduces him to Jerry. Jerry claw waves at him and Brett thinks, oh, that's a funny bit. And claw waves back. (laughs) He's like, Elaine told me you're some kind of comedian. I'm one kind, Jerry says. She asks Jerry if he's seen the chest of drawers that Brett got for Kramer. The fuckman. Farbman, Brett corrects. She says, you got to see them. They're beautiful. I'm sure they are. I'd be happy to get you some if that's what you're driving at. Jerry's like, uh, no, I'm fine. Don't worry. It's no charge to you, Brett says. He says, what you really need is a decent desk to write your skits. I don't write skits. (laughs) Of course you don't. You don't have a proper workstation. I'll fax you my catalog. Yikes. Uh, Lane has to let Brett know that Jerry doesn't have a fax machine. Oops. <laughs> he turns to Jerry and says, well, I'm sure things will be picking up for you soon. He tells Elaine they should get going, and he asks Jerry if he wants to join them. Oh, where are you guys going? The coffee shop? Coffee shop? (laughs) Brett just scoffs at him. I think we can do a little better than that. You know, you look like you could use a solid meal at a real restaurant. Oh, that was it for Jerry. You look like you could use a... (laughs) But Elaine cuts him off. Jerry? My take, I really enjoy this scene. JPS... His performance throughout this episode is great, but this scene opposite Jerry is just top notch. That choice that he makes of just, you can see him scanning the room with his eyes as he's talking. He's sizing up Jerry's furniture like the Terminator searching for John Connor. It's just amazing. Like I would imagine in his vision, he's got like all these stats going up, like uh, outdated furniture, terrible desk, like whatever. Like he's just in this mode and so intensely looking at his apartment, especially when he says that line, I want to be happy to get you some if that's what you're driving at. Like, I mean, the way he's looking around, oh, such a great performance. And you know, Elaine is enjoying 
all of this. Brett belittling Jerry's profession, his desk, calling him skits, um, assuming Jerry has a fax machine. And she's not going to defend anything. And it's delicious. I love that dynamic. And when you think about it, Jerry wouldn't defend her if the situation were reversed. So I think it's all fair. I mean, it kind of did happen, right? He didn't ask Nikki to get extra tickets for her and Todd Gack. So these friends just love to make each other miserable. They take pleasure in the other's discomfort, for sure. And most of all, insulting Jerry by saying he's poor, that's just the topper. This subplot is one of the funniest of the series to me. I mean, Brett is really hitting all the things, but telling Jerry a coffee shop is trash. And that he could use a solid meal. Oh, I love that writing. So perfect. Elaine stopping Jerry from retorting to Brett's comment is great. And I like that and I like that we see that it, it does register for Brett too. He kind of kind of looks back like he knows that he's about to be insulted. Although, I mean, based on what Brett does a little later, you know, I think he thinks Jerry's lashing out at him because he's jealous. He's jealous of Kramer's chest of drawers. Because, I mean, I think Brett would think it's impossible to think he's being condescending. (laughs) I think he's not very self-aware. All right, next, we are at Saks. Kramer is with the tourists shopping, and he picks up a hat that's $300. It's a cowboy hat. He asks Mr. O how much that would run him in Tokyo. He does a calculation. He says about 30,000 yen. Kramer's like, oh my God, this is practically free. He puts it on Mr. O's head. Giddy up, you're a cowboy now. And he grabs a few more of them. Gosh, Kramer really, really has trouble with the concept of conversion rates. (laughs) We saw that in Tuscany too. All right, next we're in Brett's car. Brett is telling Elaine he feels horrible about Jerry. He's upset that Kramer got that chest of drawers. Elaine's like, well, why do you think he'd be upset? Oh, how could he not be? Cramped apartment with outdated furniture so un Carl Farbman like? Oh, we're not going to talk about Carl Farbman all night, are we? He says, I hope not. And they start to kiss when Desperado comes on the radio and he stops abruptly. Elaine gets freaked out that maybe someone's outside. The song, he clarifies. Oh, phew. She thought it might have been that urban legend about the guy with the hook. And (laughs) well, he interrupts. Elaine, could you just not talk for one minute? I'm sorry, she says. Okay, my take on the scene. All right, so here we see Brett's love of Desperado turn from sensitive to completely creepy. Man, he's just a very intense person. But Elaine is so into it. And I do have to say, he is one of Elaine's best looking boyfriends. He's very handsome. But of course, true to every boyfriend Elaine has, he can't be normal at all. (laughs) Also, it's such a small thing, but the way he closes his eyes, like, (laughs) it's so creepy and really funny. All right, next we are in Monks. George is so upset that the carpet cleaners didn't try to give him the spiel and recruit him. Jerry's like, well, maybe they thought you looked too smart. Please. Too dumb? Kramer walks in with a super fancy suit on, says it was a gift from his Japanese friends and that tonight we're going dancing at the Rainbow Room. Jerry's like, well, you're throwing a lot of their money around. And Kramer reminds him that they're Japanese. Those TVs you watch, the sushi you eat, that kimono you wear. Where do you think all that money goes? That's right. George asks how he hooked up with them. And he's like, oh, they recognize Jerry from the super terrific happy hour. And he says to Jerry, you know, that's what you need to do, your own show in Japan. They really get you. Now, what did you do with that pilot? Well, George perks up. Yes, the pilot. And that he actually does a lot of business with Japanese TV that broadcasts the baseball games. Jerry reminds him it was awful. The pilot failed. Yeah, here it did. Because whenever you turn on the TV here, you just see four morons in an apartment whining about their dates. And Kramer totally agrees. You know, Jerry is like an orange, which is rare in Japan. Totally untrue, by the way. (laughs) All right, next, we're at the Japanese TV office. Jerry and George are there with a couple of Japanese executives, and the pilot is playing. The man pauses it and says that they're a bit confused. He really just doesn't understand the plot of the butler. And so George explains why, you know, the no insurance and the judge decrees him to do this. Is this customary in your legal system? No, Jerry says. That's what makes it such a humorous situation. (laughs) The two executives chat in Japanese. And is this making any sense? The woman says she's still trying to figure out why they brought a bag of oranges. The man says he's sorry. He doesn't think it's the right thing for Japanese TV. And George tries to convince them they're wrong. You know, you've been in America too long. You've forgotten what it's like to have no oranges. Again with the oranges, he says in Japanese. Jerry drops his mug and apologizes, saying that his hand is numb. 
George tells him, yeah, numb from endorsing checks from the super terrific happy hour. (laughs) The only response to that is, you must go now. The actress in this scene, the woman executive, is played by Akane Nelson. Now, there's really like next to nothing on her resume. The only other credit besides this episode is a movie from 1998 called Goodbye Lover, starring Dermot Mulroney and Patricia Arquette. Um, She's fine. I love the Japanese asides with the other executive. I just wish that she got to speak some English and actually converse with George and Jerry. Um, (laughs) So there's not a lot on someone's IMDb profile. I will just do a general a general Googs. Um, that's Google for those of you not as cool as me. And I did find her on LinkedIn. At least I think it was her. The picture looked very similar to what she looks like in this episode. Anyway, um, it looks like now she is the editorial director at Skechers Marketing. And before that, for Skechers, she was a copywriter like Elaine. What a great connection. All right, next we are in Jerry's apartment. Elaine is worried she's on the outs with Brett because she got shushed during Desperado. He's like, does he listen to the all Desperado station? She tells Jerry he is just in another world when he listens to that song. I mean, I'm sitting there in the car and he's out riding fences. And Jerry suggests maybe they should find their song. Any song that you feel strongly about? And she says, hmm... I like witchy woman. And she sings a little bit for <laughs> for Jerry. And he's like, oh, witchy woman. Kramer enters and tells him that they had to leave the rainbow room because of a monetary discrepancy regarding the bill. He's there to borrow some pillows. His Japanese friends are staying with him. Oh, I thought they all had suites at the plaza. Oh, well, sorry, Jerry. We all don't have checks rolling in like you. Jerry's like, well, what about all the money from the kimonos I wear? Well, they ran out of it. Manhattan can be quite pricey, even with 50,000 yen. Elaine asks, isn't that only a few hundred dollars? Evidently. He tells Elaine to pass a message along to Brett that his guests are very comfy in the chest of drawers. In them? You have them sleeping in drawers, Jerry asks? (laughs) Kramer argues that the business hotels in Japan are just like that. They sleep in tiny stacked cubicles. They feel right at home. This has international incident written all over it. My take on this scene, I tend to agree with Jerry here. Um, Elaine does sound desperado. Elaine, (laughs) wake up. You will never be as important to Brett as this song. It just just won't happen. He's showing you who he is, especially when Desperado comes on. I did want more information about why she chooses an Eagles song, another Eagles song. Um, Was that a coincidence or was that strategic because he already loves another Eagles song? I don't know. There was nothing about that in the extras, but I was like, oh, that's interesting. Or did they have clearance from the Eagles? I don't get it. <laughs> also, Elaine needs better taste in music. Um, now, if you all follow Hot and Heavy on socials, which you should, and if you don't, very disappointed in you, stay tuned to the end of the show. I will tell you where to find Hot and Heavy on the social medias. But I did a little video. I, I revealed what my desperado is, and it is overjoyed by Stevie Wonder. I highly recommend. I would play it, but I don't know if I'd get copyrighted for doing that. But just go ahead and search it up because it is it is the song where I feel my heart skip a beat when it starts every, every time. I got a couple comments. People were surprised it wasn't a Depeche Mode song. Now, that's not to say that Depeche Mode doesn't have songs where I am like, oh my God, I love it. I mean, look, I know it's like their biggest hit. It might be a little too basic for some Depeche Mode fans, but I don't give a shit. It's the song that got me into them. Enjoy the silence. It's their biggest hit. And um, yes, that song it it moves me as well. There's there's butterflies and I love it. And it's like I need it to just be blasting in my ears if I listen to it. But overjoyed by Stevie Wonder, it's it's on a different level. I, I can't explain it, except I can remember listening to it when I was like a little kid and loving it from the get go. Like if there's love at first sight, this was love at first listen. I'm sure it was just on the radio or something, but it just uh, it, it hooked me back then and it's never let go. Uh, we also learn in this scene that Kramer is the worst. <laughs> These poor Japanese tourists. Like oftentimes when I'm reviewing this show, I think Kramer is arguably the least awful of the four. Like, you know, they all have their really selfish moments. They're really awful to other people moments. But man, this episode, you see Kramer is just as bad. I mean, he takes advantage of these poor guys. He spends all their money. He barely feeds them. And also, 
why the hell didn't these guys say no to Kramer? I mean, I'm not going to victim blame, but I mean, <laughs> uh, and then also we wouldn't have this entire plot. So that's why they didn't say no. But yeah, Kramer is terrible in this episode. All right, next is a quick scene in Kramer's apartment. We just see each of the Japanese tourists in their drawers as Kramer tucks them in. <laughs> All right, next we are in Jerry's apartment. Kramer is preparing breakfast for his drawer guests. Rice Krispies, Jerry. East meets West. And Jerry says he's off to the bank. And Jerry exits. All right, next we are in Brett's car. Witchy Woman is playing and Elaine is just grooving to it. Brett starts to talk and she's like, shh, what do you think? He turns it off. She goes, what are you doing? That's Witchy Woman. I thought it could be our song. And he's like, well, I've already got a song. Okay, she suggests that they share Desperado. No, it's mine, he says. And then we hear some thunder outside. My take. Okay, Elaine, come on. This guy sucks. He's awful. I know he's handsome, but no. I would get out of that car into the thunderstorm and walk home after that. I mean, <laughs> no, it's mine. You can't share a song. I did try to share Overjoyed with, with my husband. And he's like, yeah, it's good. Like, it, just, it didn't have the same effect on him. But um, I don't think I wouldn't not share it if he was into it. Once again, the performances here are great. I like I like that she shushes him so hard and then immediately asks him to talk. She's like, shh, what do you think? Her smile after she says, we can share it. It's so sweet. Oh, it's it's face acting. I mean, she just knows how to work her beautiful face, but it doesn't work. And you know it's worked so many times. That smile has worked Hundreds of times for Elaine in her life. You know that. But not this time. You cannot break the bond between Brett and Desperado. All right, next we're in Kramer's apartment. Kramer is serving the cereal to the two tourists who are awake. And then Kramer knocks on Mr. O's drawer, <laughs> tries to get him up. <laughs> but then Mr. O says, come back in a half an hour. Oh, Kramer is so irritated, mumbling in frustration. So I, I have always noticed this. I think they've muted it, but it looks like Michael Richards does an impression of Mr. O after he says, come back in half hour. Watch his mouth. You don't hear any audio, but I think he does. And I'm going to do it here. I don't mean to be offensive, but I think this is what Michael Richards did. Come back in half hour. Like, I feel like that's what he does because like the face even looks like that. So I think he maybe did the accent and they made the very correct decision to not include it. But watch that part. Let me know what you think. All right, next we're on the street. Jerry is walking in the pouring rain and goes up to an umbrella vendor and says he'll take one. Well, it's the same guy as before, but he's with Teddy Padillac now. Look who it is. And he accuses Jerry of ditching them back in the day. Jerry says, come on, you knew I wanted to be a comedian. But that doesn't make Teddy feel any better. Where were you during the poncho craze? And that now they have an urban sombrero to contend with. And we see, let's see a guy walk by with the Peterman urban sombrero. And I like how Jerry like points at it like, what? Someone's actually wearing that? Can I just buy an umbrella? Yeah, $200. Special price for a real foul weathered friend. All right, next we are in George's office. Kramer arrives with the tourists and he's like, how about that tour? These guys want to run the bases. Well, George points out the obvious. It's raining. They have the tarp on the field. Well, Kramer's getting desperate to find things for them to do that won't cost a lot of money. George offers showing them the Jerry pilot. Kramer loves that idea. He's like, you're going to watch this show with the super terrific happy hour star Jerry Seinfeld. And they're like, OK, but then they remind him how hungry they are. Kramer's like, oh, yeah, I'll get you something to eat. And he yells for the peanut guy and exits. Wilhelm enters, asks George if he hired the sunshine cleaners that are in his office. Have they said anything to you? What do you mean? <laughs> George is so annoyed. What kind of a stuck-up cult is this? All right, next we're on the street. Jerry is still walking in the rain, all soaked. And Brett stops his car and greets him. Ever heard of an umbrella? Eh, I didn't have enough money, Jerry says. I'm sure things will pick up for you. No, it's not that, Jerry starts. And then he looks down and notices that the checks are all soaked. He says, ugh, hours of hard work ruined. Brett says, not to worry, you can spot him the, and he looks at the checks, 12 cents? Jerry's like, no, 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 it's not the money. My hand is crippled. <laughs> Nothing's working out for you, is it? Not at the moment, Brett. <laughs> he says, I'd offer you a ride, but I have Carl Farbman in the car. And Jerry looks over, he says, thanks for stopping, and walks away. All the Brett-Jerry interactions really make me laugh. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry is hanging the checks to dry and Elaine is there and she says, Brett said you ran away from him like he was the boogity man. 
Boogeyman. Boogie, she asks. I'm quite sure. Jerry asks about a song update, and she's like, no, he blew out my witchy woman, and he won't share Desperado. Hey, what do you think of Oye Como Va? Eh, well, I'm running out of guys in this city, Jer. George comes in busting. The Japanese tourists loved the pilot, and now they can go to NBC. NBC? And Nakahama Broadcast Corporation. But they told us we must go, Jerry says. But George points out, now we have our own market research, actual Japanese viewers who love the show. He says he's going to go and talk to Kramer. Jerry tells him, you know, if they offer you something, whatever it is, just take it. A call back to George totally screwing up the deal with NBC in the early season. George is about to leave, but then turns around and asks what he thought of Miss Yoshimura. You know, the network executive. You think she liked me? <laughs> I do love that. I love that parallel of him liking another network executive. We don't want another Susan situation. My take, uh, Elaine's just so desperado. I mean, <laughs> but I do love her delivery of, I'm running out of guys in this city chair. Always makes me laugh. Right next, we're in Kramer's apartment. After knocking and not getting an answer, George enters to find Kramer and the Japanese friends in the hot tub, drinking sake, just having a great old time. They're all telling George, you should come in here. I want you to come in here. George says no, but reminds them to get a good night's sleep. Big day tomorrow. They drunkenly cheer and splash water at George as he exits. Then we have a quick scene next. It's the next morning. Jerry's finishing signing the last check with a mangled hand. Next, we're on the street. George is anxiously awaiting outside the NBC office. Kramer arrives and scares him. (laughs) George is wondering where where the Japanese guys are. Oh, I let him sleep in, he says. George starts freaking out. The the meeting starts in 10 minutes. He tells him, no, he set an alarm, but, you know, they did have a lot of sake in that hot tub. George calls Jerry in a panic. Jerry, who's icing his hand, answers, and George frantically tells him that the Japanese guys had sake in the hot tub. They need to get to the meeting quick, otherwise he'll have no sales pitch for NBC. Uncle Leo? Jerry! Jerry agrees to wake them up. So testy. So we see the chest of drawers, and the men are yelling and pounding on the drawers. They're stuck. Jerry figures that the wood must have warped from the hot tub steam, and Jerry's hand is preventing him from getting a good grip, and he apologizes. He says, hang on, I'll get you out. Out in the hallway, we see Elaine and Brett. They're approaching, and Brett has an umbrella gift for Jerry. (laughs) Elaine is trying to convince him that Jerry is not jealous of Kramer's furniture. Then they hear Jerry yelling from Kramer's apartment, and they enter to find Jerry taking an axe to the drawers. Not the farbman! Brett runs to him, and Elaine screams. My take is not much to say. It's just a funny series of events to combine all the plots. All right, next we are at the NBC office and the Japanese men are telling their harrowing tale to the executives about Jerry being a lunatic and uh, that they wouldn't let him out of the drawer and he came at them with an axe. George is sitting there smiling away, not understanding, but thinking that they're giving a really rave review about the pilot. The executive tells them that they also think George is unbalanced. Mr. O looks at him with fear. George is still smiling. So we have a deal? Mr. O asks if they can have some of the oranges. They haven't eaten and they've survived many hardships. And all of a sudden, the sunshine carpet cleaners walk in. The executive tells George that they're there to clean the coffee stain left by Jerry Seinfeld. George sees Mr. Wilhelm with them in uniform. What are you doing here? Says that he's there to clean the carpets. Most of the world is carpeted and we will do the cleaning. George can't believe it. He turns to the other guy. Him, you brainwash? What does he have that I don't? The guy just shrugs. He tells Wilhelm, you need to listen to me. You've been abducted. Wilhelm, he says, my name is Tanya. And the executive says to the other executive in Japanese, he can't believe the Yankees won the World Series with these two idiots. There's a tag to the episode in Jerry's apartment. Elaine has an ice pack to Brett's head and Jerry's apologizing. I didn't mean to hit you with a axe. At least it was just the handle. And Brett is so distraught. Those beautiful cabinets. What am I going to tell? I can't remember his name. Fleckman? Elaine tells Brett to calm down. You could have a concussion. She knows how to comfort him. She starts singing Desperado and Jerry joins in. They get through some of it and then Brett just passes out on the table. Then we see him at the ER and the nurse says his pulse is fine and the doctor thinks it's just a minor concussion, but he'll do something to reduce the swelling. And all of a sudden, witchy woman starts playing because, you know, 
<laughs> There's always music playing at an ER. And the doctor gets totally distracted and goes into a trance. The nurse tries to get his attention. I think we're losing him. But he's totally into the song. And we hear the beeping getting faster and faster. And Flatline, did Brett die? <laughs> My take, it's a very funny ending. Jerry and Elaine singing together is so perfect. And But like, really, did Brett die? It's so funny. If you watch it on Netflix, it doesn't go flatline. The The sound effect from the heart monitor does not go beep at the end. But on the DVD, it does. So I wonder if Netflix was like, um, we can't have this guy die. <laughs> But I guess back in 1996, they were like, whatever, uh, Brett's dead. And Jerry did it. All right, I'm going to take a quick break, and I will see you on the other side. Honey, help! Oh, Bill, shrunken head again? I told you that party was a mistake. I know, I know. Hang on, let me get the bike pump. Don't let this happen to you. Before your next encounter with a witchy woman, be sure to take Hagament HP, the only medicine that will prevent a hex before it happens. Due to the world being a terrifying hellscape, we've seen a rise in Wiccan conversions in the past eight years. So witchy women are now your neighbors, accountants, Amazon delivery people, and so on. And one thing is for sure, the allure of a witchy woman is undeniable. Now getting cursed is rare, but the witchy woman temper is very unpredictable, so irrational hexing does occur. Also, we can over gesticulate, which can cause accidental spells across an entire room, especially for a newbie witchy. But fear not, if you ingest one tablet of Hagament HP before your witchy woman visit, you will be protected from any spell, curse, or hex that may come your way. Available at all CVS pharmacies, for a limited time you will be entered into a raffle for an original piece by none other than Carl Farbman. I have a Farbman cauldron, and it's gorgeous. Hagament HP, medicine for mortals. And we're back. There were no extras of note. So why don't we go ahead and move on to Greg's sack lunch? We had a week without a sack. And I think we all felt it, you know, just to make Greg feel much more <laughs> guilty than he already felt. I tried to convince him it's okay. It's okay if he needs a break and he can't do it for a week. But Greg had a lot of sack guilt. First in Greg's sack, I find his overall thoughts. He says, This episode is another one of those that are sort of just okay for me. Elaine's story of dating another guy with an eccentricity, this time a guy who zones out when Desperado comes on, is probably the funniest of what the four get in regards to plots. Uh, I agree. I agree. I think this is the funniest plot. <laughs> Right next, his favorite scenes and Elaine moments. He says, I like how when Elaine is first quieted when Desperado comes on, she puts her hand on her chest as though she's so moved by this guy's response to a song. A song I absolutely can't stand, by the way. Same. Oh, my God. Blech. But I love how the next time it happens in the car, she gets scared at first thinking someone's outside the car. And as she laughs and keeps babbling on, Brett shuts her up coldly. I know. That's why I said, like, at first it was sensitive. She loved it. And then it turns to creepy in the car. It's like, wait, what, again? Like, seriously? Um, especially because they were kissing. Like, that's another layer of insult there. It's like, um, hello, <laughs> we're getting physical. And you still have to stop and stare and then close your eyes at the end. Yeah, back to Desperado. I, I'm just like, nothing the Eagles really do does anything for me. Um, I I remember watching the documentary about the Eagles, and I believe I watched it because I'd heard on a podcast, I think John Mulaney talked, just like raving about it, saying that he'd watched the documentary at least like four times. He was obsessed with it. So I was like, all right. I, I love a documentary, and I actually, my favorite genre of documentary is a music documentary. So I love, even if I don't know the band very well, not familiar, I will watch any music documentary. I won't say it was bad. I, I really thought it was going to convert me and be like, oh, my God, I'm gonna have to make like an Eagles playlist after this. I, you know, they're like a classic band. 
But yeah, nothing. I do like Don Henley. I like his solo stuff for sure. And Glenn Frey, um, The Heat Is On. I love that song. <laughs> My husband would totally disagree. But um, The Boys of Summer by Don Henley. Come on, classic. But as a group, all I learned was they're all assholes and narcissists and just suit each other. <laughs> That's don't, You don't have to watch the documentary now. I just summed it up for you. Greg goes on to say, Elaine's choice of Witchy Woman, another Eagle song, as a song she offers up to Brett to be their song, is a funny moment where she sings it and Jerry says, oh, Witchy Woman. It makes me laugh. And I like how he turns her down <laughs> on both that song and sharing Desperado. Why is she with this dick? Exactly, Greg. This is what I'm saying. Jerry's assessment of her being Desperado, it's very true. I think it's because he's so handsome. I'll get in. I'll get more into it. I have a little bit of a theory that I'll get into with my final notes. But yeah, it's like he's not just creepy with this song. He's also a dick. Oh, shit. I forgot. <laughs> Going back, I'm sorry, Greg, I skipped a line that you wrote. You said Brett shuts in the last point. You said when he shuts her up coldly and that she's now more intrigued by him. Yes, 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 yes. Um, but yeah, this almost is like getting more and more attractive to her in a weird way. And she's just determined to um, get in on this desperado action. <laughs> All right, next, Greg says, my favorite Elaine moment is probably when Elaine gets choked up and says, well, I'm running out of guys in this city, Jer. Verge of Tears Elaine is one of my favorites. I also like how she mistakenly says boogity man <laughs> and is surprised that it's actually boogeyman. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I do love the delivery of that line for sure. Um, and yeah, boogity man. I like it has nothing to do with anything, but it's just one of those friend moments you have where it's like <laughs> you fuck something up and they're like, Wait, what did you say? <laughs> and yeah, boogity man. It reminds me of when she says Svenjali, and it's supposed to be Svengali. It's always Jerry correcting her, which I don't always love, but it's still funny. Next, Greg says, lastly, I do love how Jerry and Elaine duet on Desperado at the end. It's a cute moment. Oh, I love that. I love it. I never get tired of it. Next in his sack, I find Greg's scene swap idea. He says, George's story with the cult is okay, but Kramer's story with Long Duck Dong from 16 Candles and the other Asian guys is just ridiculous. Having them sleeping in the drawers of the Carl Farbman makes for a funny bit, but everything about pitching the old pilot to a Japanese network and everything is just... Oh, did something get cut off? You guys, it ends at just. I might have copy and pasted that wrong. Bear with me. I'm going to check his email. See, you guys, a little behind the scenes. I take Greg's email and I copy and paste it into my notes. Greg, I think you forgot a word. <laughs> um, I'm going to make an educated guess and you were going to say is just OK. Um, yeah, it gets a little too complicated. I it's weird. I I hmm, I appreciate the thought going into this. But like I said, I don't like this side of Kramer. This is a bad look on Kramer. He's awful to these men. And the fact that they're like foreign tourists and Kramer's just such a fucking idiot with them. Like it makes me a little bit angry. Totally takes advantage of them. And then even after, okay, it's like, all right, I'll spend all your money, but you can stay with me. Yeah, you're making them sleep in drawers because you're making an assumption of their comfort level because they're Japanese. And then it's like fucking feed them. You're constantly at Jerry's house. You're constantly at the coffee shop. Why can't you get them more food? I don't that part in particular really bugs me because <laughs> I think we can all relate to being really hungry and it sucks. So yeah, Kramer, terrible, terrible look for Kramer this episode. And finally, Greg's extra thoughts. He says, I do love the callback to the urban sombrero when Jerry is talking to the umbrella salesman. I get caught in the rain here in New York City all the time. And honestly, the idea of an urban sombrero is growing on me. Greg, do it. Start this business. I think you could do it. <laughs> um, I could see that in a city, although walking in the streets of New York with an urban sombrero might be a little bit complicated. But yeah, you, you need one of those like pocket umbrellas that are really compact. Just my advice to you, Greg. And thank you so much, Greg, for your thoughts this week. You know, we we didn't get them last week. So thank you for finding the time. Jeez, just kidding. And now it's time to close Greg's sack lunch. All right, my favorite Elaine moments. I do like the cold open. I think my favorite moment is when she gives Jerry notes. 
I really do like that. I think that it's um, I think I like it so much. It's not like it's particularly a funny performance, but I like I just like that moment of friendship there where she's like, I don't want to hear your bit, but I'm going to listen and I'll give you know, it's like it's just it's just funny to me. A close second. <laughs> I just really enjoy. I enjoy how much Elaine is enjoying Jerry getting pelted with insults by Brett. But I do love when she's like, Jerry doesn't have a fax machine. <laughs> she takes such pleasure in embarrassing Jerry. It's so good. And I have to say, Jerry Seinfeld's reaction to he's kind of like, kind of looking down all shameful. <laughs> My final notes for the episode. I really think this episode is fun. Elaine has a solid plot, but it's more of a supporting role. And we really see how far Elaine will go for a man that she's really into. I mean, such a difference from like Putty, right? Like she wouldn't put up with any of this crap with Putty. <laughs> but I think Brett has, like I started saying during Greg Sack Lunch, I think, first of all, Brett is very dashing, very handsome. But I think more than that, he has a certain status that she's really attracted to. I mean, he's got this fancy car, so I think we can assume he's very well off. And she just wants to be in his fancy designer furniture world. <laughs> I really would have liked George to be more involved with Elaine's plot. I think it would have been really easy because George is such a cheap ass. He would want some free furniture. Like maybe for whatever reason, whatever Carl Farbman stuff he gets, or it's like the super ugly ones or I don't know, like something involving... George trying to take advantage of Brett and his free furniture hookup. That just would have made more sense. I don't love the whole Japanese television pilot thing, but I guess it does also track with George's character. I think he would try and definitely do that because he would see an opportunity to make a lot of money, but it would not have been as good as George and Brett. They would have had some really fun scenes together. <laughs> Overall, it's a solid episode that really makes me laugh, but it could have been a great episode if there were some Benestanza moments throughout. And I think we can all agree with that. Benestanza, George, Elaine, best combo on the show. Always a better episode when they have a lot of scenes together. I don't know why I'm talking like this, <laughs> but I'm keeping it in. So you're welcome. And I think that's all I can say about the checks. Please be sure to follow the pod on social media. On Instagram, it's at Hot Heavy Elaine. On TikTok, at Elaine Bennis Podcast. And if you'd like to email me, please do at ElainePodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time. 